In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we talk about bulking, gaining, getting more muscle, speeding up the metabolism, increasing the way your body looks in terms of its curves and firmness, or just building more mass. But we talk about doing it the right way. Oftentimes when people try to increase their calories and train for weight gain, what they end up with is a lot of body fat and a little bit of muscle. So we go through the process of how to clean bulk. Clean bulk refers to gaining lean body mass and not all the body fat and crap that comes sometimes can follow uh, with it. Now, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Legion. Now, Legion makes some of the best performance-enhancing supplements you'll find anywhere. Now, the reason why we like working with Legion is their supplements are transparent. So when you look at the bottle of whatever you get, uh, what it says it has, it has in there. It's all verified by third-party testing. They also show the amounts of each thing, so you don't get proprietary blends. I know a lot of people don't like that because they don't know exactly how much creatine they're getting in their creatine supplement, for example. None of Legion's products are flavored with artificial sweeteners. Um, they have one of the most popular pre-workout supplements that are out there. Uh, pre-workout supplements are good to give you that extra stimulant energy sometimes people need, but this pre-workout called Pulse by Legion also contains beta alanine, citrulline, and other components shown to improve performance, especially in advanced lifters. The other favorite supplement we have from there uh, are, is Recharge. That's their creatine supplement. And if you've listened to Mind Pump for more than five episodes, you know how big of fans we are for creatine from everything from building muscle, speeding up the metabolism, and just improving overall health. Uh, so you can get the Legion Mind Pump discount by going to buylegion.com. That's B U Y L E G. ION.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump at checkout. Get 20% off if it's your first time purchasing from them. If you're a returning customer, you get double rewards points. Also, all month long, uh, Maps Strong is 50% off. Now, Maps Strong is an excellent program for building strength and muscle. It's a strongman inspired resistance training program. Now, that means you're going to be doing a lot of traditional exercises. But you're also going to be doing a lot of fun, different movements that you probably haven't done uh, in your routine in a long time or maybe ever. Uh, another thing about Map Strong, it really does place a special emphasis on the posterior chain. That means your back, your butt, and your hamstrings. Okay, so if those are areas you want to focus on and you want to build, uh, Map Strong is a great program. So it's fifty percent off. Here's how you get the discount: go to Maps Strong. Dot com. That's M A P S S T R O N G dot com. And then use the code STRONG50. That's S T R O N G 50, no space for the discount. Let's talk about bulking, the uh, concept of this the, is the fun part of training. The bulk. Actually, before we get into that, can you, oh, well, I, we're, it's getting into this, but I mean, uh, can we say it, call it something else? Because I feel like right away it turns off women. It's true. Yeah. Totally true. That, I mean, you need a rebrand. I mean, we're, we're saying bulk because that's what it's commonly referred to, but really it's a, it's a, it's a cycle of diet and training that are where the, where the goal, the target is to gain mm. lean body mass. And I think it's essential. Let's call it build. Can we say it's essential? A it, hundred. This is a hundred percent true. Yes, it, it is an essential um, cycle. I think even if your goal is to lose weight and get leaner, the process of I'm going to do in quotes here you know, bulking. Um, will help with that process. And again, that's a good point you make, Adam. Really, it's about building. It's about getting into a positive tissue growth mm -hmm. phase. Uh, but there's also um, a lot of other side effects that come along with that. Besides a lean body mass gain, it speeds up your metabolism. It results in a, in a body that burns more calories all the time, both because you now have more lean body mass and more muscle uh, requires more calories to support, mm -hmm. but also because the signal of bulking, which which we're going to go through how to do this properly, the signal that it sends to the body is to not worry so much about being so efficient uh, with calories. Um, and the reason why I said that is you'll have some people say, oh, the metabolism boosting effects of building muscle are overstated because you know three pounds of muscle really only requires X amount of calories to support. It's not that big of a deal. But that doesn't tell the whole picture right. because I would routinely – take clients through a proper, you know, building process and they may only gain, you know, like a female client, for example, might only gain two or three pounds of lean body mass, 
but their caloric uh, maintenance, in other words, the amount of food that they could eat and not gain any body fat, Goes would up go up hundreds mm-hmm. of calories, 500 yeah. calories. I've seen people's metabolisms go up by 800 calories, small people too. Mm-hmm. So this is definitely, there's definitely some, uh, some, some, some tremendous benefit to this aside from the, you know, building lean body mass, which by the way, speaking of women and building lean body mass, this is what gives you that, that sculpted look. Uh, you know, if gaining two or three pounds of muscle um, on your body, you're not going to look bigger. It's not that it's not enough muscle to make you look bigger, but you are going to look tighter, and you're going to yeah, feel more defined. Yeah, more carved. It, it's it's ironic that this. I know the title, whatever Doug in the titling, and I mean, if he puts bulk in there, it's it's uh, going to turn off a lot of people that don't think they want to bulk and so think it's not for them. That's why I wanted to address that right out the gates because the truth is, as we go through all these points and talk about this, um, it, it, in my opinion, it's more important for women. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, usually because they don't want to do this at all. Right, right. right. And, it's and, against the grain. And and similar to like we talk about, you know, the best thing that you can do is the thing you're not doing when we talk about exercise and, and program design and because it is novel – uh, I think this, the same thing is similarly true to uh, nutrition. It's uh, so common that uh, when I would assess a, a female client's diet, that they were uh, under consuming calories. And normally for long periods of time. Mm-hmm. By the time they hired me, they're, they're frustrated. They've already been doing this for a long time. They've gone up and down or they've plateaued for a long time. And I, I don't know how many times uh, this has happened to me where – uh, I get a client who's you know 30, 50, 100 pounds uh, overweight, and when I assess their diet, I'm just blown away by how low of calories they eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it used to be one of the biggest challenges for me as a coach. This took me years to to get over this hurdle. Oh, I thought people were lying for years. Right. Yeah. I went through that, and that's why it took so many years. The first half or the first few years or whatever – uh, it, it was, I thought people were lying. And then once I realized, oh, wow, this this is, they're not lying, that they actually have slowed their metabolism down over years of, uh, of diet, yo-yo dieting and ex- eating excessively low calories. Uh, and now what I know I need to do is going to be really, the other half was, okay, now I got to convince this lady who's sitting in front of me who you know, is, you know, really down on herself because she's uh, up 30 or 40 pounds. I need to convince her she needs to eat more calories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's not an easy conversation. Oh, no. it's a it's a real difficult one. And and to your point, like I, I just remember uh, the mentality of, you know, some of my female clients that I've had forever where if they go, if they exceed their calories at all above their maintenance, it, it was like they failed. And that's just been something that they've kept in mind for years. It's not just like something that's like, uh, you know, every now and then, like they, they allow themselves to, you know, splurge a little bit. It, it, it's the sense that if they're if they're exceeding their their maintenance calories and they're not in a deficit, then they're doing something wrong. And so this just, you know, it, you think about that over, you know, a long time period of constantly trying to reduce calories, reduce calories and like how easy that is to see how their their metabolism slows down. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with reducing calories to burn body fat. But when that's all you do um, and it's it's combined with an other signals that tell the body to become efficient with calories. It's typically what happens. People cut their calories, cut their calories, and it does work at first. Um, and then they add cardio, and it does work at first until the body starts to adapt to that new – because here's the thing. Your body gets good at whatever you do a lot of. And if you're eating a low calories and doing lots of cardio, your body gets really good – at having endurance and burning few calories. It's just what happens over a long period of time. And so it's important to try to reverse that through, you know, a proper building phase. You know, I used to have uh, female trainers that work for me. I used to love using them to demonstrate to potential clients the benefit of doing this. Because whenever I, when I used to manage gyms, a lot of what I did was uh, talking to new members or potential new members about proper exercise proper resistance training, why they should probably work with a trainer or what, how be, you know, being a member of the gym, if they do it properly, is going to really benefit them. And I would often talk about this, what we're talking about right now, how you speed up the metabolism because having a faster metabolism today is a huge advantage, mainly because there's a lot of food around us and we're busy, but we don't move a lot. We're just not burning a lot of calories and there's a lot of food. It's everywhere. We're going to eat it. Um, it's enjoyable. So you want to put yourself in a position to be able to you know mitigate all that or at least you know live in this modern world 
uh, with some advantages. So I talk about this, and oftentimes I'd hear the, the women say something like, you know, well, you know, but I, I think I have a lot of muscle already. I don't want to gain any weight. I need to lose weight. Like, let me just focus on losing weight. Once I lose a lot of weight, then I'll, then I'll worry about building. And then what I would do is I'd say, you know, give me a second. I'm going to have someone come in here. I'm going to show you something. And I would page one of my trainers, uh, my female trainers, to my office. There was one in particular. She was five foot one. Um, and lean. I think her body fat was probably 16 or 17 percent all the time, which is visible definition. Um, it's not so lean that she, you know, she was too lean, but she was. If you saw her, you'd think to yourself, "Oh, that's a fit uh, athlete." And she'd walk in, you know, all five foot one of her, and I would tell the person to guess their trainer's body weight. I'd say, "Don't," you know, and they'd of course feel embarrassed. And I'd say, you know, and then my trainer would say, "No, no, no don't worry, you can guess my weight." And I'd say, "Okay, how much do you think?" She weighs, be totally, totally honest. And sometimes I would even spruce it up a little bit and I'd say, if you're right, if you get within five pounds, uh, I'll give you some some free personal training sessions. Uh, and that would motivate them to be honest. And they'd say- Knowing they're going to fail. Yeah. No, I'll, <laughs> never. They would never guess right. And they would look at her and they'd say, oh, she's, I don't know, 110, you know, 105, 110. I'd say, okay, that's, that's a pretty good guess. Let's go walk over to the scale. We'd walk to the scale. We'd weigh my female trainer who would weigh a good 20 pounds- heavier than what they thought. So I was able to illustrate that the muscle is that muscle is very dense. She looks like she weighs 110. She actually weighs 130 or, you know, 125 or 130. Then I do this follow-up question. I'd say, can you please be honest and tell this, you know, this person how much you eat every single day? And she'd, oh, I eat like, I don't know, 2,700 calories, 2,800 calories. And then I'd show them in food what that means. And they'd be blown away. And I'd say, wouldn't you like to be in a position where you can eat uh, maybe as much food as you're eating now in terms of calories, it would still have to be healthy, but you know, you're eating as many calories you are now, but you're losing weight. Wasn't that a better situation to be in than reducing your food intake right. and losing weight and then stopping and having to reduce it more and more each time? And they would always, they would get it uh, at that point. That was always a very powerful way of, of communicating that, but that's the value of, of going through that building phase. I know I don't have to uh, sell the, the other values of, of building if you want to build. Obviously, if you want to build, you want to know how to build. Well, that's right. why I wanted to start with uh, addressing women right out the gates mm -hmm. is because I don't want to lose the attention of our female audience because they don't think that they fall in the category of bulking. Right. It applies to both. Right. And we're talking about, obviously, every every uh, hard gainer or skinny guy ears yeah. perk up when you say bulk because that's what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is that I, I probably spent more time with female clients talking about this and, and trying to communicate this than I did with, with men. But uh, on the men's side... So the, the conversation was a little bit different. The, when uh, I'd have male clients at bulk, most of them did it really wrong. So guy and, and guys love to do it. And I, I'm just as guilty of this. Oh, boy, I got some stories. Yeah, I, I'm just as guilty of, all right, it's bulk time or it's bulking <laughs> season, you know, <laughs> yeah. which really all that meant was there was no strategic plan to build muscle, really, or to gain strength or to just... It was about shoveling food. It was about I was allowed to eat whatever I wanted because I was in a bulk and I was trying to build. Therefore, I get carte blanche. I can go bananas with whatever I wanted to and eat. And it was a season because yeah. there was no end to it yeah, sometimes. <laughs> right, right. And and you would time it normally around Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, so you can excuse yourself for all the crazy extra calories that you would eat. And uh, what you would find, and let me tell you, this is uh, so prevalent uh, in, the, in the gym culture that even at the highest level of professional competitors, uh, I see this. Um, I've, I think I've touched on this on the show before. That um, when I when I would see some of these athletes, my peers at the time, uh, dieting and training for a show, they would still kind of live by these rules. And I would watch. We'd all be training in the same gym in the off season, and we'd we all be in the quote unquote bulk bulk time. You know, it's we're not ready. Prep time is the final. You know, six to twelve weeks before you get ready for a show. All the months leading up to that would be considered you know, bulking time or or building. You know, and I'd be watching the way they all eat, and they're putting on you know, 25, 35 pounds uh, during this, you know, few months of getting ready for prep. Mm -hmm. And what would happen is, you know, they would peel all the way down, get shredded three to 5% body fat. 
And I would be looking at the same exact physique that I saw, yeah. you know. Maybe like a one, two pound difference. Not, not even. Not yeah. even. The same, same, yeah. literally like the same. It was Ugh. just part of how All they. All that work. Right. And, and and not to knock them, they look great. <clears throat> they got on stage. They competed, they competed at the highest level. Uh, but they weren't improving. And they weren't improving because of their method of bulking. Right. You know? So, you know, what is the goal with bulking? The goal is to gain lean body mass, not body fat. Now, in some cases, some body fat gain uh, may be desirable. This is for people who are super, super lean. Like if you're a man and your body fat percentage is below 10%, um, and you want to st start to gain some muscle, you're going to probably have to gain a little bit of body fat to do that. When you're really, really lean, uh, your hormones get affected a little bit. It's harder to gain muscle. The body likes to gain when you're lean, but not shredded. Uh, for women, this is probably when you're below like 17 or 18% body fat. You're probably going to need to gain a little bit of body fat. Not a lot, just a little bit to get into that good you know, building stage. But aside from that, the goal is not to just gain uh, body fat. Um, this is this was my problem. So or, I was, or, or just gain weight. You should say because, yeah. like, of course, no one's goal is to gain body. Nobody goes on a bulk and says, "I want to gain well, body fat." Well, that's where right. I'm going because right. like, this was my this was always my challenge. Uh, now I was that that skinny hard gainer. I was that ectomorph that you know my body uh, just didn't seem to want to gain any weight. So when I went on a bulk, it was all about the scale. I didn't look at anything else. It was how much weight can I gain on to the point where I would prefer foods. That would make me even hold water because the scale uh, would go up, and I liked the fact that the scale would go up. I remember one time in particular. This was when I was uh, I was in my twenties, so by this point I'd been working out for a little while, and and I under and I you know I was really really dedicated to to gaining weight, and so I was uh, I was pretty good at it. And I went through this bulk period where I, my body weight went from I don't know two hundred five two ten to two hundred and forty pounds. I gained like you know almost thirty pounds on the scale, which is a tremendous amount of weight. For somebody to gain, especially uh, someone with my frame, and, and somebody who's an advanced lifter, who's right. been lifting for a long time, and I'm lifting and all that stuff. You know, I mean, two ten for me is pretty muscular, so I gained, you know, thirty pounds on the scale. And I remember this was the first time, first off, that I went all in and and consistently. And second, I tested my body fat. So I tested my body fat before, and then I didn't test it until after. And I was, uh, I wasn't, it wasn't pleasantly surprised. Whatever the opposite of pleasant is, uh, that's how I was surprised. <laughs> I tested my body fat, uh, all 240 pounds of myself, super proud of, you know, all the weight that I gained in the, you know, I don't know how it took me like four months or whatever of this bulk. And um, I had gained like a few pounds of muscle, according to my body fat percentage, like 27 pounds or something like that uh, was all not muscle that I had put on my body and I had this rude awakening like what it, like I t it was a waste of time mm -hmm. I gained a few I could have gained that few pounds of muscle without gaining the additional 20 something pounds of body fat um, and a big mistake a big part of that was um, all I did was look at the scale yeah. I didn't use any other metric and so I kind of lied to myself a little bit as I was going through that process we look. used to do these uh, competitions Justin probably remembers this um, with my trainers I love to do this we we would get the hydrostatic way so the dunk tank right where you submerge underwater to get your body fat percentage one of the more accurate ways to do it and we'd have an outside source do it so it was fair and we'd have these competitions it was a fun way to engage my my staff uh with staying focused on staying fit and uh, it would do some sort of a cash reward afterwards for the the person with the greatest muscle gain if we did a muscle gaining one if we did a fat loss one the greatest percentage of fat loss and that was when I really like I when I first started doing that. And that was about five six years into my career, uh, where we had something like that. That was someone else was tracking. We were all competing each other, and that was like the consensus. And I'll never forget like when when it when it first happened. When I first started doing it, how many trainers were like, "Oh, this is bullshit. This thing's yeah. inaccurate." You just can't yeah. believe it. Yeah, you can't believe <laughs> that it. That happened to me. You didn't yeah. want to believe it, right? We, and and I and I agree. I felt the same way. Like this can't be possible. Not all. All of us can't be this bad at this. Like we're all trainers. We should know what we're doing. Right. But it was it was true. It was accurate. And it was because we all kind of fell into that that old way of of training and dieting of when you go on bulk, you just again, like you said, Sal, is trying to gain on the scale. And what would end up happening is, you know, you would put on, on as equal and this is what what sucks about it is even if you added, let's say you're 30 pounds, because this would happen to me. Maybe I added 20 or 30 pounds. And I actually gained 10 pounds of muscle, which is awesome, 10 pounds of muscle. But because I gained 20 pounds of fat with it, 
when I decided to pull off the 20 pounds of fat, because I don't want, you know, if I put on all this extra weight to build the muscle, the idea is that I have just the muscle and get rid of the fat. So then, okay, okay, now let's go to a cut and you start cutting. Well, in order to lose 20 pounds of fat, it's really hard to not lose 10 right. pounds of muscle along the way. And this is what happens even at the professional level mm. is you see guys and they do, they, they put on some muscle. They don't, they don't fail at putting muscle on during that time. And they know it because they can see their strength go up and they can visually see it. But because they put so much excess fat on with the muscle that when it comes time to cut, mm -hmm. they've got to go through a pretty aggressive cut to get rid of 20 pounds of fat. And it's almost impossible to not lose some muscle. Mm -hmm. And when the ratio is that high to fat to muscle and you got to go that far back down, it's inevitable. So you end up doing 30, you gain 30 pounds to cut off 20 pounds of fat. And when you do that, nine pounds of the muscle, you netted one pound. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like after it's all said and done, you went through training for three months of all this up and down dieting to get one pound of muscle. And you could have done that in a way that was way easier and yeah. didn't require so much, uh, I guess, damage to the body. Yeah, oh, it's, it's so misleading because you do feel the strength gains because like being on a higher calorie amount makes you feel like better. I have more energy. I have more strength output. My performance is increasing. Therefore, I have to be gaining muscle uh, through this process, and it's it's one of those things. Like even like on the athletic level, you'd see guys that would like through the entire uh, off season or through the summer, their whole goal was to gain this muscle, so that way they come back in with all of this new you know strength and performance ability. And, you know, when they have to go down to shed the weight and get back into the cardio and move quickly, you know, all of that progress is just completely back to, to where they, they started. Right. So you can use the scale, but also use body fat tests and also look at your strength. But don't just look at total strength. Also look at your strength to weight ratio. This is important because let's say you gain 20 pounds on the scale but your in your bench press go or your squat goes up uh, five pounds. So you did get stronger five pounds, but you gained twenty pounds on the scale. As a as a percentage of your body weight, you technically got weaker. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Now it doesn't have to be one to one. It doesn't work that way. At some point, it, you know, when you're smaller, you have a better strength to weight ratio than versus when you're bigger. But that's a pretty big difference. So what I would start to do later on when I got good at this is I would look at my strength gains, look at my weight gains, and say, okay, I gained. 10 pounds of body weight, my strength went up, you know, five to seven pounds. I think I'm okay. Uh, if it was 10, if it was one to one, I knew I was great. But if I gained a little bit of strength and a lot of weight, then I knew, uh oh, I gained uh, a lot of body fat, especially right. when you do the body fat test. Which I'll, you I'll take it an even step further. So I literally went from one side uh, <clears throat> of the paradigm to a complete opposite. Like it was, or <clears throat> spectrum, I mean. Uh, so I went from, the guy who all he cared about was the scale and watching that, like you saw, just you know, and eating same thing, eating foods that held water, whatever, just to keep that get that number up, because I was obsessed with it. To actually going the complete opposite on a bulk. So now when I bulk, I actually don't. I I'm only watching the scale to make sure I'm not losing. So my goal is actually not even to see the scale go up that much. If it goes up one or two pounds, whatever, not a big deal. But I'm actually using the scale to say make sure I'm not losing. And my goal is to actually slowly keep adding calories without seeing a major fluctuation on the scale. Can I keep adding calories into the diet without seeing my scale dramatically go up two or three pounds? And if I can see that and then I can also watch my strength, I know I'm in a really nice place. So if I, let's say my goal is to bulk right now and I weigh 215 pounds and I want to bulk, I'm, I'm monitoring my weight while I'm increasing calories and watching my strength. And if I see my strength go up and I know I've added calories to the diet and my scale doesn't stay the same, I like where I'm at. I'm in a very good place. I'm probably building muscle. I'm getting stronger. I'm adding calories to the diet. I feel confident about it. In fact, I might even be losing a little bit of body fat at the same time. Oh, you mean is, the calories stay, oh, the weight stays the same? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. Which mm -hmm. that, to me, that would have been, I'm failing. You know, but 10 years ago, if I was trying to be on a bulk and my scale wasn't going up, I would have thought I was failing. Mm -hmm. But I actually look at it now as a very good place to be. Now, it's hard mentally because your goal is to bulk yeah. and to not see the scale. But it, hey, listen, if you know for a fact you've added calories to the diet and you are maintaining strength or gaining strength on your big lifts, 
you're in a very nice place. Yeah, a slow gain is king when it comes to uh, a bulk. you got to understand one thing, especially if you're natural, right? If you take anabolic steroids, it's a little bit different. It's a different conversation. But if you're natural, uh, muscle gain is not a fast uh, process. It just isn't. you got to understand that muscle, number one, is a very expensive tissue for the body, meaning it requires a lot of calories to maintain. And number two... Muscle is very adaptable. It, it, if you have more muscle, it's because your body thinks you need more muscle. It, you never have more muscle than your body thinks you need. You're never stronger than your body thinks you need to be. It just doesn't. It's expensive. It would make no sense, uh, especially considering how our bodies evolved for, for most of the time that we've been on Earth. It makes no sense for your body to be super muscular and burn all these calories when you sit around all day long. You don't lift heavy things. You don't need it. So the muscle gain process is actually... Uh, when, it, when you're talking about lean muscle, is actually pretty slow. Now, in men, here's some numbers, okay? And, of course, this can vary depending on your genetics. There's some genetic freaks out there that are a little bit different here. But for the vast majority of people, I would say for men, you're looking at anywhere between a two to four pound gain in a month. And that and four is aggressive. You're getting four pounds a month. Uh, that's pretty aggressive for a man. So you're probably going to be closer to the two pound uh, gain a month if you're going to be leaning, if you're going to be bulking uh, properly. For women, you're looking at about one to three pounds. One to three pounds a month of gain is perfectly fine. I used to like my female clients to maybe gain a pound uh, in a month. Oftentimes, they, what would happen is what Adam's talking about, where I'd test their body fat, and they did, in fact, gain a pound of muscle, but they also simultaneously lost a pound of body fat, and so the scale actually didn't move at all. If your scale is moving up faster than that, um, it's, you're, you can be pretty sure that what you're gaining uh, is not necessarily muscle, maybe water, and of course, it may be uh, body fat. That's why you got to be careful not to allow the scale staying stagnant as a sign of you're not doing really well. There's, a, there's actually a very good chance, again, if you know you're increasing calories uh, and you have good programming, there's a very good chance that you've, you've hit the sweet spot. And, and that's a great place to be where you have a, a very close to even exchange where you know, you're losing a little bit of body fat and you're also gaining a little bit of muscle. And so the scale is kind of maintaining. That's why, and this is also why I'm, I, I do like to track and I, and I think it's so important to learn this about your body and how it responds. Because if you are if you know for a fact that you're adding calories and you know for a fact that your program's on point, you know, you're, you're probably building muscle. Even if the scale is not going up, you're just also probably losing a little bit of body fat. And that's a great place to be. That's the best mm -hmm. place to be. Now, for calories, I'm going to give some general numbers that are going to apply to a lot of you. Not everybody, but a lot of you. But typically, you of course, of course you need to eat more calories than you're burning. So let's start there first. You, your body won't add new tissue unless it has the building blocks to do so. So that means if you're burning every single day when you include your activity, I don't know, 2,000 calories a day, you can't add new tissue at 2,000 calories, and certainly not at lower than 2,000 calories. You need to supply your body with extra calories, extra nutrients to build this new tissue. Now, typically, what you want to do is go up, increase your calories about 10% above maintenance. That's generally where you want to go if you want to do this the, the right way. So what does that mean? Well, if you're if your maintenance uh, calories, you, you figured are about 2,000 calories, and now you want to go on this, this clean bulk or whatever, uh, you add 200 calories. That's 10%. Mm -hmm. What if your calories are 1,300 calories at maintenance? Well, that's 130 calories. So you guys get the idea. Add about 10% uh, above maintenance and then wait a few weeks to see what happens. If you're not gaining muscle or strength, you can add a little bit more. But for most people, 10% above maintenance with good programming, that's really important, uh, will do the trick. Now, do you guys have a preference of, of where that 10% comes from as far as proteins, fats, or carbs you, that you typically recommend or find people have more well, success if, with? Well, if protein is not at one gram yeah, per pound of body first. weight, yeah, then I'll go protein. Usually. Yeah, but once yeah. I'm about a gram per pound of body weight, um, and if fat is essential, if they're eating enough fat, then I tend to add carbs. Carbohydrates tend to build a little bit. In my experience, they tend yeah. to do better in this phase than than more Those fats. are the two essentials. And then carbs is really where I start to play around with, uh, you know, adding that in and seeing how that then increases, uh, you know, their performance sp specifically in the gym. Uh, that's, that's one of those where you can, you can really, uh, you know, see the difference when you start adding carbohydrates when, when that really wasn't, uh, you know, very high for a lot of clients beforehand. So, so yeah. if I'm, if I actually like to push a little bit more with, uh, protein, so I'll, I'll push it to the upper limits of like 1.5, 
uh, before I start to do other other macros. I just find that if we're trying to stay lean and we're we don't want to do go over at all, and you I have room where they're you know at one or less grams per pound, I'll I'll start pushing the upper limits of that before I start, and that's. We're also taking into consideration they're they're hitting the essential fats, right? If you're getting the fats that you need, right. <clears throat> I I prefer to go. Make sure you have good fiber with that, <clears throat> right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I I'm gonna prefer to go the the protein route first before I start to go over in the carbohydrates because here's another thing you have to consider when you start to increase carbohydrates. For every three grams of carbs that you add to your diet, you're gonna hold on to an yeah, extra hold on water. three ounces of water, right? Yeah. So it's a it's a a nice exchange as you start to add up. So if you are increasing uh, carbohydrates, one of the things that throws people off sometimes is they're like, oh crap, I only increased 200, 200, uh, 200 calories, but you did it all in carbohydrates. And now all of a sudden you're seeing weight gain go pretty fast and it could throw you off on if you're doing a good job mm. because you see the scale you're measuring it right. like that. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So not also good- like holding water, you do feel the difference in your performance too. Like uh, that's something I've noticed like specifically, you know, maybe I am a bit water retentive, but man, like I could just feel the strength gains in the gym as a result, which then motivates me to then push. It. No, you're that's, that's actually hundred percent. Right. I experienced the same thing when you're, when you're, when you have a little bit more fluid uh, in your body, especially if it's in your mind, muscle, they tend to contract harder and perform a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, this is why, but here's right. the thing, we're, we're kind of splitting hairs right now right. Um, with, with because at the end of the day, I, if you're trying to bulk, you probably shouldn't go below one gram of protein per pound of body. And I say probably because there are those people out there that might have digestive issues with that much protein, in which case at the end of the day, by the way, you have to be healthy. Uh, you can't follow a protocol. And if, and if you're trying to gain mass or muscle, and you're unhealthy, it's not going to work. So if you do move your protein up to a gram or 1.5, as Adam said, per pound of body weight, and you find digestion is terrible, right. you don't feel good, bring it down, increase the calories with one of the other uh, macronutrients. One thing is for sure, you definitely should not be too low on carbs or fats. I, I don't think a keto diet, for example, oh, good, is a, is a great here. way to, oh, yeah. even if the calories are high, in my experience, for most people, it's not a great Extremely way to, tough. to yeah. gain, you know, to gain lean muscle. Now, in the cases where that's an exception, you may be somebody where your your gut health uh, really benefits from going super low carbs. In which case, health trumps all. Uh, you may be somebody where you know too many fats does the same thing to you. In which case, I'd say you know bring the fats down a little lower. But most cases, you don't want carbs or fats. You don't want to be a low fat, you know, on a low fat bulk or low carb bulk. That typically uh, doesn't work well for a lot of people. Now, the most important thing when you're trying to add lean body mass is to send an effective muscle building signal. If you don't do this, you're not going to build muscle. You can add calories all you want, add protein. Um, Your body has no reason to add muscle. Mm -hmm. So you want to follow a routine that uh, really revolves around muscle and strength gain. I mean, it's got to be the goal, right? That's your goal. Yeah, you don't want to go into a HIIT workout or like a plyometric type of training or circuit or orange theory type of thing with this intention. No, it's. I would say the range would be between powerlifter and bodybuilder. Like that's the kind of program you want to follow. The program that we have, the programs that we have that would be great uh, in a lean bulk would be like MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Strong. MAPS Strong's on sale. It's half off this month. That would be a great lean muscle gain program. But yeah, a, a hip program or a program that's working on stamina and endurance, um, you're not going to really do well uh, with those because they don't really send a loud, you know, hey, build muscle you know, type of, uh, of signal. Now I also like, so, and, and that there is an exception to that rule and that is, it depends on what I've been doing also. Right. So when I make a transition from a bulk or a, uh, or a cut, I also like to transition my programming at the same time. Mm-hmm. So if you were fo- following a maps anabolic and that's what you've already ran, and then you're going to transition into bulk, I would change to, you know, map split or strong or something different. That's novel. Sure. Because there's benefits to that, right? Like you're, you're like Sal said earlier, when we were talking about calories, <clears throat> same thing goes for programming that, you know, your body gets efficient and adapted to whatever it is that you've been doing. And so if you've been doing something consistent, training a certain way, a, a certain modality, 
and you're about to make a transition to either a bulk or a cut, it's also a really good strategy to change your programming up because it's going to be novel. Right, and but different. that but that program should still be a muscle or strength <laughs> right, right. focus program. Right. And that's why I use the analogy of okay, let's say you're running anabolic, making it to an aesthetic, you know, split or strong yeah. is a, a, a probably more advantageous strategy than going to a, a hit workout or maybe maps performance. Yeah, you're, you're looking at maps aesthetic, maps anabolic, strong, split. Uh, those are probably the maps power, you know, those are probably the best programs uh, to build uh, if, if you really want to build muscle. God, maps really power lift would be an incredible one, actually. That's another one, right? <clears throat> um, now, here's there's another myth uh, around bulking um, that I believed for a long time, which was to eliminate cardio. Do zero cardio, right? You don't want to burn any excess calories because God forbid you burn those calories and don't use them to build muscle. Right. Now, I discovered this as a myth years ago. I remember I was doing, you know, I was going through this process of trying to gain muscle. I was always trying to gain muscle, but I was, you know, trying to attack it pretty aggressively. And I remember one of my trainers, uh, he was a pretty muscular guy and you know, he would he he was laughing because uh, you know, one day he was on uh, one of the spin bikes and I was going to go uh, take him through some sales training and he said, "Hey, would you mind doing it while I'm doing the spin bike because uh, I learn better when I'm moving um, and it, you know it helps me out. And I said, yeah, I don't care. Of course, no problem. So I went in the room, the spin room with him. I got on the spin, the spin bike next to him um, and I started you know, doing my, my training with him. Um, and I was, as I was talking with him, every once in a while I'd start pedaling the pedals and I find myself you know, out of breath. And the reason why I was out of breath was I was always trying to build. So I avoided cardio like it was kryptonite. Like this is anti-muscle. I'm not going to do it. And he commented on it. He goes, man, he goes, your cardio is really bad. And I started laughing. I said, I know, it's terrible. I said, but I'm trying to, to gain muscle. And he goes, you know, I, I, I tend to gain more muscle if my cardio is at least pretty good because then, it, then I'm not so limited when I do squats and deadlifts and my health's a little better. And then it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, you know, uh, if I'm getting winded by messing around on a spin bike while I'm talking to this guy, maybe it's preventing me from building muscle. Maybe my health um, isn't good to build muscle. So what I did is I started incorporating just some light cardio, some hikes, some inclined treadmill work, a little bit of the stationary bike. And lo and behold, I found that I built more muscle. And the reason why I built more muscle was my health improved. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can overdo cardio. Overdoing cardio can cause uh, you to burn too many calories and maybe send a wrong signal. But eliminating cardio might uh, reduce your health, in which case, if you're not healthy, good luck trying to build muscle. It's not going to happen. Well, uh, you know, a good example of this, or a good gauge uh, I like to use, um, and I, I know the the rhino, right? Stan Efferding uh, talks a lot about 20s. And if you can't do 20 squats- um, Oh, geez. You know, and do about- That's a great measure. Right? Three sets of that then your cardio endurance is limiting your potential. Because I'll tell you what, one one of the things that made my legs explode was running a phase where I was running 20 sets or 20 reps of squats. It's just, it's brutal and it's so novel and very few people like to train up in that range. And you'll build muscle, even though it's not in that one to five rep range, which is tends to be the more typical place that people stay. Going and doing 20, uh, 20 reps of squats, if you've never really trained that way consistently, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll definitely bulk you and build some build some muscle. But if you can't do it because you're so gassed, because you don't have the cardiovascular endurance, it's hindering your potential to build muscle and bulk properly. Totally. Right. Yeah, and, and I th think about this too of low frequency or you know low intensity type uh, you know movement and, and activity throughout the day too like staying and remaining active is another signal in itself that your body uh, wants to respond and, and promote uh, you know more muscle and, and strength to, to provide uh, stability and support around this movement and so like one thing to consider too is like cardio comes in various forms it's not just like running around on a treadmill or like go, going out and running or jogging or it, it really is just staying and remaining active Active and, and frequently moving, and that's a signal in itself, which uh, you know I think is is relatively not talked about enough uh, in terms of neat and, and and being able to do things constantly throughout the day. That adds up to uh, you know quite a bit of of extra calorie burn. Yeah, oh well, yeah, daily walks and hikes was my favorite way. Yeah, that was my favorite way to do it. Well, think of this too that it you doesn't know, compete with the muscle signal. A, a big part of bulking, obviously, is or the the whole part of bulking is is building muscle, and you know a big part of building muscle is the recovery phase is the ability to recover 
uh, fast and efficiently right. so you can build more muscle and staying active and you know keeping your knee up and moving and doing cardio is only going to facilitate recovery faster right yes so you you have to factor that in now that being said there's also a balance right like who I'm talking to there's always going to be that individual variance and us always saying depends mm -hmm. because there's also that kid that I was when I was you know 20 years old that was wakeboarding snowboarding basketball playing sports all the time and lifting weights seven days a week that I was getting plenty of knee, plenty of cardiovascular exercise and endurance, that it was hindering me from getting enough calories. It was just hard to keep up with 4,500 to 5,000 calories. And so you need to know that about yourself. Like if you're somebody who is extremely active, uh, you don't need to go out of your way to probably do more cardio if you're already that active. Well, that all comes into factoring that TDD. TDE. -E. Yep. Yeah. So basically, you're taking your maintenance of calories, but also factoring in what that activity looks like for you individually. And right. so if you can really nail that down, you'll have a better idea of like uh, w not to exceed that or to like maybe pull back a bit in order to allow room for you to uh, build muscle. Yeah. TDE stands for total daily energy expenditure, it just means how many calories you burn uh, throughout the day speaking of high rep squats you know what's funny uh back in the day the old time you know muscle builders and strong men which i love looking to for for wisdom because this was before anabolic steroids before all the bad information was coming out uh in the in the muscle building magazines or internet you know that, that, that were driven by supplement sales they didn't even have creatine or oftentimes protein powders so they just did what worked you know what they used to advocate for 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 building big uh to muscular legs hmm. 20 20 rep sets of squats deep breathing these call them deep breathing squats so what they would do and they didn't do cardio back in those days it was just they, they were probably active in their jobs let's be honest back in those days people were pretty physical but they didn't go and do cardio but they did lift weights and what they would do is they would do sets of squats and in between every rep they would take two or three deep breaths and then they do another squat mm. that's 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 gonna be a little bit of cardio oh yeah you know, oh, not even doing that is hard imagine taking the deep breaths in between and then having to squat and they would say that it was just phenomenal uh for building uh you know good muscle the next thing which is this is this next one is very important regardless of what your goals are uh but it's especially important if you want to build muscle which is get good sleep mm. prioritize good sleep now remember your body does not want to build muscle unless it has to because more muscle means more calories to support and keep you alive. Your body's always trying to uh, you know, increase it or improve its odds of survival. And because we, we evolved or our, our bodies evolved where, where food was scarce and things were dangerous, it was always on alert and ready to say, oh, hold on a second, let's, uh, let's burn less calories just so we don't need as much food. Well, lack of sleep is a great way to tell your body uh, not to build muscle because uh, lack of sleep uh, is a strong stress signal. And if you think of for most of human history, if you're not getting good sleep, it's probably because you weren't safe or it's probably because you were trying to find food because you weren't able to find food during the day. Not sleeping is a fantastic way to lose strength and muscle. In fact, I, don't, I, can't, I shouldn't even have to convince people uh, everybody listening right now knows exactly how weak they feel when they go to the gym the day after uh, they get terrible sleep. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's a terrible one. So uh, I tell people this, we all prioritize our workouts. We all prioritize our priming and the pre-workout and, you know, we have our programming set, but we treat sleep as a total afterthought. Know. You know, we mm -hmm. all expect to just lay in bed, hit the pillow and get uh, excellent recovery, muscle building sleep. We do at least until we get in our forties, right, or close to our forties. <laughs> then we value the shit <laughs> out of it. That's. Yeah. What, I just really think it's that. Like I think we're just in, so invincible in our twenties that it's like I don't care. I I really believe that because it comes easy. I really believe Adam today could not go back and convince Adam of twenty one that he needs to do sleep. That's why, like, <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. If right. Adam in his twenties had uh, all the responsibility of Adam in his forties, <laughs> he would be convinced. Because this is what I remember. My, you're right. I did the same thing, but. But you also, in your 20s, had the freedom. You didn't have all these responsibilities. You had the freedom to like sleep all day on a Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't. I can never have that opportunity now because <laughs> no. I have kids and responsibilities. Well, and and you, and you, I think we, you become just more aware of your own body. Like I don't think that uh, I wouldn't have benefited from it in my 20s. You know, I absolutely. I just think I was so stubborn back then, and I thought I was doing just fine. I probably would have seen twice as much results in my 20s had I prior to it. Now, when I see, and that, I guess older, wiser, smarter me now is I, I can move my my weight, change my body composition relatively fast because I know how to turn all these knobs really well. And sleep is one of them that 
for a long time wasn't one of the knobs that I focused on and is a game changer when you do. You mm -hmm. add, and it doesn't always mean too like you know, like it's inevitable, right? Uh, you're going to have a, a, a not a great night of sleep. I mean, if you have a normal life, uh, you know, work is going to stress you out one day. Your partner is going to piss you off one day. Your baby's going to wake you up in the middle of the night. Dog's going to shit on your carpet. <laughs> yeah, or your, <laughs> shit on your chest, up. right? Yeah, yeah, on my chest. chest. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's going to have These things are going to happen. Pissed, dude. Right, right. Yeah, that's okay. what it was. Yeah, so, sorry. Not, not shit. So, you know, th these things are going to happen. And when they do happen, uh, learning to adjust the workout to it. You know, and 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 really trying. I was, I was having this conversation actually this morning with uh, uh, my client. I was telling her that, you know, we're, we're we're manipulating her calories right now, and I was telling her to try and time, you know, the the higher calorie, good sleep, good workout, all in one day if you can, like to be, you know, just so we can get the max benefits. So, if you know that you didn't have the greatest sleep ever, and you were planning to do twenty rep squats that next morning, maybe that's not the best morning for you to to train that way. Maybe you you take it a, a different day or take it easier and leave the day that you get really good rest to get after it in the gym. I just I have found that when you learn to navigate that way with your workouts, your sleep, and your nutrition, your body just responds really well when you, it's already stressed because you didn't sleep very well, and then you decide you're gonna punish it inside the gym as hard, harder than you've gone any time recently, it doesn't it doesn't really respond the way you yeah. think you where's you, the time for all the the muscle building right. no it, it, it all it views it all as too much stress yeah, it revolts you can actually lose muscle that way right if, if you push it too hard you could be working out eating more calories uh, but you're, you're because you're getting shitty sleep and your workout is inappropriately intense uh, you can yeah. actually lose muscle I've actually seen this happen on um, people before and I'm not giving you the I'm not giving you the excuse to not go to the gym now yeah. right or you Adam know, says if everything's not perfect, yeah yeah right so you got to be careful you got to be careful because some clients are just waiting for that, right? That they're like, oh, you don't need to work out hard. Oh, great, I'll take the day off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you just you work more in. You take it easy. You you back off the intensity instead of that being an eighty to one hundred percent intensity type of training day. You go in, you train, you move, you still exercise. That's still good for you. That's still beneficial. You just learn to pull back because you know you didn't get good sleep that night, and just watch out. Watch how your body responds differently. Totally. So treat your sleep like you treat your workouts, and what I mean by that is take it seriously. So here's a few tips that uh, typically make a pretty big impact on somebody's sleep quality for most of you. Okay. Number one, about two hours before bed, make sure you shut off all electronics and go by dim light in your room uh, or in your house. Now, if this is not feasible for you, if you need to be on electronics two hours before bed or you like to watch TV right before bed or you can't turn down your lights because you got kids or whatever, um, then try wearing blue light blocking glasses. Blue light blocking glasses uh, block the light that comes from electronics that most affects your brain. Um, because here's what happens. When you go to bed and you lay on your pillow, it's, it takes your brain a second to register that the sun has gone down. So for most of human history, this was natural. We'd be outside, we'd be doing things. The sun slowly starts to set. Light starts to get darker. It gets dark. The brain has already started registering. Oh, it's almost time for sleep. Then when it's time to go to sleep, your, bre your brain is prepared. You, you lay down and you get right into that quality sleep. If you don't do that, if, if if the lights are bright, your brain is getting the signal that says, sun is up, sun is up, sun is, and then you close your eyes and your brain goes, oh, wait, we need to sleep. All right, give us a second uh, to get ready, um, and it delays that, even if you fall right asleep, because I know some people will say, well, I, I fall right asleep when I hit the pillow, so I don't need to do that. Studies show that although you're asleep, you're getting less of that quality sleep, and they do this by measuring all the stages mm -hmm. of sleep. So do that. That's number one. Uh, number two, don't eat right before bed. A lot of people have issues with sleep when they do that. Make sure the room is cool or cold. Uh, sleeping with minimal clothes seems to improve sleep uh, quality in a lot of people. And then if you need something to help you relax, if you tend to be one of those anxious people, you can try some natural herbs. Uh, Passion Flower has some natural relaxing properties, chamomile. Uh, although you can't use passion flower all the time, but chamomile is great. Chamomile is so mild that uh, in Europe, they oftentimes will recommend it to children. Um, you can sleep, you can drink chamomile on a pretty much regular basis. It's a very, very mild, but natural relaxing kind of sedative. I like to do that about an hour before bed to kind of ensure that I'm you know, relaxed and, 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 and I get to go to sleep. Now, the next question is, uh, when, when do I, stop. yeah, when do I stop? Hmm. When does the bulk stop? When do I, Never. you know, when do I start to reverse <laughs> gears or whatever? Um, the big sign for me is when the strength gains stop. 
Yeah. Like I'm not getting stronger right now in the gym and, and no matter what I do with my programming and calories, uh, the strength isn't really going up. That's when I know that, okay, my body's had enough of this, this signal. Now it's time to kind of reverse gears, either focus on mobility or maybe do a mild cut, do a real light cut to kind of change the signal a little bit. That usually gets things moving again. So we didn't really touch on that. And I think that's important. Like, so we kind of, uh, we talk a lot about um, cutting and bulking and we, we, we recommend mini cuts and mini bulks, which are, you know, relatively short, two to four weeks tops, right. Of, of staying in a phase of cutting or bulking. And so if I'm in a bulk phase, I may extend my phase longer than four weeks of bulking. I may be bulking for as long as six weeks, but I will interrupt it with little mini cuts. And that may just be uh, you know, a few days or even just one week of a, a more lower calorie diet for a while to interrupt that and to go back on the bulk. I, I definitely recommend that. That's like one of the way and I'm watch so I'm watching strength, I'm watching scale, and if I if I feel like I've started to plateau then I'm going to interrupt that by going the other direction mm -hmm. for a little bit. And so, and that, and this is the individual variance that may be three low calorie days. It might be a whole week of kind of lower calorie days and then go back to your bulk after that. Um, body responds really well to that versus just constantly trying to push calories, push calories for extended periods of time, five weeks, six weeks and beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like this because it allows you to continue this building process for a long period of time because you are interrupting it with these shorter periods of you know maintenance or, or lower calories. This is extremely valuable for uh, for women who are trying to balance hormones. Whenever I'd work with feet with women who have gone through long processes of dieting and overtraining and their hormones are all over the place, we would do we would build. We would focus on building for a long time. But I would interrupt it with a few days or a week here and there of maintenance or slightly lower calories just to minimize fat gain. But the whole the, the overall process would would maintain until we'd start to see hormones start to balance. I've had female clients who, you know, couldn't get pregnant. We went through a building phase and then finally were able to because things balance out. Same thing with men, not as common, but sometimes guys who stay lean all the time, the testosterone suffers quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And through a building phase, you start to see testosterone levels go back up. I, I also like that strategy for people that struggle with being able to uh, eat enough calories because they're just not hungry, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes when you've been, you know, eating high calorie, high calorie, you, you know, and this has happened uh, many times with clients and myself, where it's like, oh my god, it's just so hard, Adam, yeah. to get to that. It's a job. 20, yeah, it's like, and so I like to reverse out and and go low for a while. A lot of times that will stimulate that appetite again. They'll be like, oh my god, I went from being stuffed all the time to now I feel like you're starving me all. And then now we go back up. That sometimes will help stimulate them uh, that appetite and them wanting more calories. That's it a helps. big indicator for me, especially like uh, the inflam inflammation being a factor in that as well. Like being on a higher calorie amount consistently, like uh, my digestion gets affected after a while. Like I could feel the you know those those common symptoms of like being under a lot of inflammation, where the the achy joints, things like that. Uh, but yeah, like to be able to interrupt that and then go back into a co uh, a bit of a cut it will really help to kind of relieve a lot of those yeah. issues. Now, here's here's another tip that'll help you with this. Um, try to stay away from, uh, you know, overly processed or highly processed foods. And here's why. Not necessarily because they're unhealthy, although usually they are not as healthy for you as whole natural foods for the most part, but mainly because those foods encourage you to eat more. This is just what they do very, very well. So if you're already in the mindset of gaining and you're throwing in these hyper palatable, highly processed foods, the slow gain that we're talking about, not going to happen. It's going to turn into a fast bulk or what they call a dirty bulk. So I would say try to avoid the heavily processed foods unless you're somebody that really struggles with appetite, which is pretty rare. I'm glad you went that direction because I, I, I know there's got to be somebody that who's listening right now who struggles with getting enough calories, especially trying to stay all clean. Uh, when I, this this applied to me when I especially when I was competing. Yeah, the real hard gainers maybe. That's yeah. Right. yeah, well, and even somebody who's I mean, when you get to when you start getting towards that upper end, like when I got up to you know uh, when I was competing, I was eating you know five thousand calories. Yeah, you try and eat five thousand calories of chicken breast and sweet potato. Yeah, or just yeah. unprocessed food. Yeah, right. It's just so a good strategy is to hit what your body needs through all whole foods and natural. This is this was the rule I gave myself. If I was going to enjoy a five guys burger or I was going to pile on some, you know, processed type foods in the diet, if I was going to allow that in there, 
I first was going to get what my body needs, the protein intake, get the good essential fats and my basic carb, the basic macro breakdown of what my body needs through whole foods. And then I would use the hyper palatable foods to help push me to that caloric intake that mm -hmm. I needed. So mm -hmm. that's just a, it, there's, there's no great science to support why that's better or not. I have just found that works really well for me. It's worked well for my clients is to go after getting everything through whole foods first. And then you use those hyper palatable foods to help push you yeah. beyond. In that. that case, I used to say this, I used to say eight, let's, I want 80% of your calories to come from uh, at least 80% to come from un yeah. unprocessed whole natural foods. And then I would allow the 20% just because if, if it, and, and this is only for some people, people like, like, you know, what, like Adam, like what he's talking about, because when I would allow other clients to do this or even myself, it very quickly, inevitably would Gets spiral. From you. Oh, it would spiral right. every time because remember those foods are really, really good at getting you to eat more. You're already in the mindset of building. If you're not tracking everything, very fast, it gets away from you almost every single yeah, time. Yeah, this is really only it, it. It mostly applies to my male clients. It, it was rare that I had a female that uh, you know could, I couldn't take her from fifteen hundred to two thousand through health, healthy yeah, calories, sure, sure, right? Sure. Like that's it's when you start getting up to those numbers like four thousand, five thousand calories. That's a lot. Of, I mean, that's a thousand calorie a meal, volume, yeah. right? A thousand calorie meal four or five times a day. Oh yeah, you know, and, and if you're doing that through, like I said, whole foods, that's a that's a monster mountain to climb for some people. So that that's the only exception to the rule that I would say that I would do that with. But I know there's people listening uh, that can relate to that. So I wanted to address that. Excellent. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. You can watch us on YouTube. If you like listening to us, imagine how much you like watching us. Uh, so go check us out, Mind Pump Podcast. Also, you can find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. The fitness industry also started to come up with terminology that would attract women. So, you know, for men, you could definitely attract them to resistance training by saying build muscle. But for women, if you said build muscle, then you would you would elicit these images of, of big bodybuilders. So yeah. like, we can't say build muscle. We got to say something else. So they created the term toned. Toned. 